Hello and welcome. Depending on where you are joining us from today, good morning, good afternoon, or perhaps even good evening. My name is Mike Scott, 2009 Miami graduate and Miami's current Senior Director of Development for Regional Programs based remotely here in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this session of the 2021 Winter College titled Politics of Vaccination in U.S. History. If that is what you came to hear, you are indeed in the right spot. For 17 years, Winter College has been the Alumni Association's premier alumni education event. And while we'd love to be sitting with you in Charleston or Miami or Phoenix, we are excited to be able to bring this year's event to an even broader audience through this virtual format. We have a spectacular lineup over these next two days. You can navigate the full schedule by clicking events by type on the website's top toolbar and selecting Winter College 2021 from the drop down menu. Join programs, even if you can only drop in for a portion. And if you can't make it to a particular session that's of interest to you, please know that all sessions will be recorded and posted online for you to view at your convenience. Speaking of that spectacular lineup, we have one of the best with us right here, right now. Your instructor today is Dr. Amanda McVitie, professor of history and NOS family faculty scholar. Dr. McVitie's interests lie at the intersection of international relations, science, and the environment. Relevant to today, in 2018, she penned her second book titled The Rinderpest Campaigns, A Virus, Its Vaccines, and Global Development in the 20th Century. The book is a history of the ultimately successful international effort to eradicate rinderpest, better known as the cattle plague. Dr. McVitie teaches courses on international relations and the history of medicine. She has been teaching in Oxford since 2006. Now, on a personal note, Dr. McVitie was my senior capstone professor back in 2008, a class that was focused on the life and legacy of Teddy Roosevelt. To this day, and I have no incentive to be a teacher's pet at this point, I can honestly say it remains one of my favorite classes I took at Miami, and I am delighted that this afternoon we will all have the opportunity to listen to Dr. McVitie without the stress of an impending exam at the end of her lecture. Thank you, Dr. McVitie, for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Today's session will last one hour. We will have time in the final minutes for several questions, and we encourage everyone tuning in to please submit them throughout the presentation by clicking the Ask a Question button below the video. We will relay those to Dr. McVitie at the conclusion of her presentation, and she will be answering as many as she can. Now with that, I will turn it over to Dr. McVitie. Thank you, Mike, for that very warm introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you this afternoon and talking about the politics of vaccination. So where I wanted to start was thinking about, you know, the images here on the document. How do we get to a place where we have these recommended right, immunization schedule from the CDC? So we have the federal government um, creating this recommendation of a large number uh, of vaccines for children. And then on the other hand, we have you know, an anti-vaccination um, movement within the United States. And so what I wanna do in the talk today is sort of look at the birth and sort of um, where both of those things came from and how we got to where we are today. And that story begins with smallpox, which was the first vaccine. So. Smallpox was the worst, um, it was a leading cause of death in 18th century Europe. It is, was sort of understood to be the worst disease along with the plague. It had a very high mortality rate, um, but even survivors had um, often horrible scars, um, blindness, um, a series of other um, sort of repercussions, even if you didn't die of having had smallpox. And famously, Edward Jenner, um, created vaccination. And vaccination was um, just about, it, it was a, the word described to just this procedure that he invents. So by the 1720s, Europeans and Americans were doing inoculation, which was saying if someone had a smallpox scar or you know, a pustule, they would take some of it out, some of the lymph of that, and they would cut someone else's arm and put it in there. And that would create an active case of smallpox, but it would almost always invariably be a milder case 
of smallpox. Then someone would get, if they got smallpox from breathing it in, um, sort of a normal way of getting the disease. And Jenner figures out, again famously, that this disease that milkmaids have, that he calls cowpox, this disease, if you in fact take that, if you take the lymph from one of those ulcers or pusses, and you know he put it in a child, you can create a case of, of cowpox and that will protect the person from smallpox. Now, it's interesting, in 1939, they did studies and in fact, the vaccinia virus, which is what the smallpox vaccine is, isn't actually cowpox, they're not the same thing, they are distinct. And that virus is actually closer to horsepox than it is to cowpox. And Jenner himself at the time, you know, as you can see in this writing, he thought it was the horse had it first, um, and then it goes to the cow and then from the cow to the human. So he even himself sort of sees the horse as a central part of the story. Uh, but they called it cowpox. And there's the, the variola vaccine. It was the smallpox of the cow and it creates the vaccine. And it's right away embraced. It's embraced all over Europe. You can see how many people are vaccinated right away. And um, it, the, the paper he writes is translated into numerous languages and they actually start sending the vaccine abroad and they would take threads and he would take threads and they would put it in the pustule and then dry it and send them by mail. So they would send these threads and that's how they share the vaccine. In one way, these, these sort of dried threads. And sometimes once they arrived somewhere, they would still work and you could infect a cow with it and give the cow small or cowpox and sometimes it wouldn't work. So they had the other way they would do vaccination is often um, children and orphans. And they did sort of a living chain of vaccination that, you know, there would be, you could get maybe 20 vaccines out of one pustule of a person. So they would you know, vaccinate 20 people from one person and then one of those people, they would vaccinate 20 people and they have living chains. And some of those even stretched across oceans. They sent people on ships with to vaccinate in, in, in the Americas um, with people, with humans, sort of using them as a chain. And it works um, in many ways. So in the US, or the first US government um, involvement in vaccination, is this act in 1813 and it's an act that you know the federal government wants to wants to help this to encourage this so you can see here that the president um, is appoints an agent to preserve the genuine vaccine matter and that's the issue you either have to preserve it in human beings passaging or you have to preserve it in cows passaging it and they try both or they're using both methods at the same time and again you can see also the shipping that you can ship it for free. So you can ship those threads soaked in vaccine matter for free in the mail. Now, the problem with this method, especially when they would use um, humans and children's, is that of course, if someone had another disease, if they were infected by something else, that would, that would be shared with the person. And it happens many times with syphilis. There are these outbreaks of syphilis after people have been vaccinated. Now, of course, this is before germ theory. They don't fully understand what's happening, but they believe that you know there is some sort of contagion that is coming from this. So this um, helps explain why when we look at the data, there isn't just like a, there isn't like a sudden jump to vaccination and then smallpox disappears in part because people have conflicting ideas about the vaccine. And that gets us to the birth of this anti-vaccination movement. And on one hand, people are very nervous about these outbreaks of disease. So they're nervous that, you know, we thought we were just sharing cowpox or we thought it was cowpox and it was actually smallpox. And there's concerns about that this isn't well regulated, right? It's just, you're uh, many people are producing it just whoever has a cow that they have infected or, you know, um, in state orphanages, they will do this. So it's just the children going down, down the line. Now, it also isn't um, a permanent protection. 
So as you can see here, Jenner said at first, he said, this will protect you for life. But of course, he had no data on that to say that. And it becomes clear that it works for about five years that you won't get sick from zonepox at all if you have cowpox. Now, it will protect you against death or really serious illness for about 20 years. And that's part of the story here of deaths. So the yellow line is Sweden, which had the clearest, oldest record. So that's why you know the chart goes back as far as it does with Sweden. But you can use Sweden and say you would have seen similar rates of death from smallpox in these other European nations at the time. So with the introduction of the vaccine there, and you can see in 1800, the numbers do go way down. And Sweden was aggressive about vaccination. Now, if you look a little bit later, you see the 40s, the 60s, there's still deaths to smallpox, and it does kind of vary from year to year. And then this massive escalation in the 1870s. And part of that was because people had stopped getting vaccinated. And in some ways, it's because the success, right? And partly the vaccine was a victim of its success that people weren't seeing the you know massive, massive deaths to smallpox that they had seen in the past. So then they thought, well, what's the use? I mean, is it worth the risk of getting vaccinated if people aren't dying of smallpox like they used to be? And they stopped fearing it. Now, this image is pretty famous about the, you know, of the cowpox. And that shows you this is from 1802. So right away, there were people who were also very, you know, they were hesitant of what of what this is, right? To just put this disease from a cow into a human body, what would that do? Would it turn people into cows? <coughs> but a more structured anti-vaccine movement comes in the middle of the 1800s. And this is part of the sanitary movement in Great Britain, is that the government itself starts seeing from a public health perspective that vaccination is a good thing. So in 1840, they say, you know, we will vaccinate you for free in a ban on inoculation, which was that old way of using smallpox itself to inoculate someone against smallpox. And that would lead to outbreaks of smallpox. So they, you know, they want to get rid of that altogether. Say so you have to do vaccination, you can do it for free. Well, as those, as the number of sort of cases of smallpox still don't disappear, they say in 53, well, they're going to make it compulsory. And then in 67, well, you can actually be penalized. You can be fined for not having your child vaccinated. And the compulsory part was really what got the, the creation of the anti-vaccination movement. And take a look at this poster here. You can see this gives you a sense of the argument they're making against vaccination. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold. So in one hand, you can see here, right, there's money in it. So the sense was, well, the state is making this compulsory just so the doctors will get rich, right? The people who are producing this vaccine are going to get rich. Um, you know, they're saying they're mocking the idea that board, like that cleanliness and sanitation can't work. Because, of course, the argument is cleanliness and sanitation are going to get rid of smallpox, that you don't need vaccination, that if you actually just, um, you know, practice better hygiene, you will in fact drive this disease out of the city and it will no longer exist. And this, this lasts for decades, this anti-vaccine movement, and it leads to in 1898, um, the British government basically gives people the right to be a quote unquote conscientious objector to vaccination. And that's where the term comes from that later is used in the war, um, but it actually originates about vaccines that you can be an objector to vaccination. Now, in the United States, right, since that law they passed in 1813 and had taken away later in 22, the federal government is not involved in vaccination. It's a state issue, you know, as, you know, it largely remains to this day in many ways. So it's, a, these are state laws. And what happens in the 1850s, here, you know, Massachusetts is the first state to require vaccination for public school. And as you can see, this is a picture from around 1900, I think, 1905. And just look, so this was in um, what we call in some ways propaganda for vaccination, that the members of this family with the mother got smallpox 
and the child in the center wasn't vaccinated, but the other two, quote, had been vaccinated the year before because of school vaccination requirements. These two children, you know, they don't get smallpox. So the argument is, right, that school mandatory, um, mandatory vaccination for school saves lives. And there's a lot of images like this that are put forth to say this is the reason why the states are doing this. But in response to those increasing state requirements of vaccination is the creation of the Anti-Vaccination Society of America and intimately linked to the British version. And in fact, the head of the British um, Vaccination Society comes to the US to help them found this in 1879. And again, this is a 1902 example. You can see um, what they're thinking, right? What is the, the ideology here in the imagery? You know, sort of, um, you know, taking the words that other people call them half mad, half misguided, right? We dream of a time to come when it shall be lawful to retain intact the pure body mother nature gives. And this language is really important because you see it, you know, it continues on um, in the modern anti-vaccination movement, this idea of the pureness of the human body, um, that nature is the way to heal the body, that, right? That, the, that your own body has within it everything it needs to be healthy. Um, and also that liberty, right? This question of liberty, that should the government be able to force you to vaccinate your children to get them into school? Here you can see, building on this, this anti-compulsory vaccination hymn. You can take a look here at the words. And, get, and I think the filling their veins with poison is again, that imagery, that, that the vaccine is poisonous. And they use that word a lot when they talk about um, vaccines in this, in this time. Now, in part, right, and their argument would be, well, there are all these cases where, um, you know, people did get sick from vaccines because there was something else in the vaccine. Um, <clears throat> when you cut someone's arm at that time, right before you're, you're not sterilizing any equipment. So often people could also get other kinds of bacterial infections in that space. Uh, to try to um, push against those complaints in the 1860s, they move in Europe and the United States to saying vaccination has to be from cows only, that you can't, this human to human vaccination is not a good idea and shift to just producing vaccine by cows and working on trying to, to regulate that more, you know, more regulation of the production of the vaccines. Um, and I give you this because this also talks about where some of the, the opposition comes from. And, and Hodge is in this, he might have been the president of the Western New York Homeopathic Medical Society. And again, that like that homeopathic medicine had been created in the 1790s. And the idea was that Right, the sense of um, you want to use the human body, right, is, is regulating itself. And if you do introduce any medicine, it's a very, very tiny amount, like the least diluted amount. And vaccination goes against those principles. So, what's interesting when we think about 1902, and that's those past few documents we've looked at have also been from this year, is smallpox has broken out in turn of the century America, there is, there is an outbreak, a, a sort of a nationwide outbreak of smallpox. Um, and that brought a lot of these ideas, these concerns about it to a head. But what's interesting is the smallpox virus that is over most of the United States in this outbreak is not variola major, <coughs> which is the original smallpox virus. And the variola major is the smallpox that is about 30% um, fatal, right, mortality rate. And this is actually, now we know, it's variola minor. It's, so it's a different strain of, of the virus. And it only has about a 1% mortality rate. So what it meant to get smallpox in 1902 was very different than what it had meant to get smallpox in, say, 1850. So that's also part of the shift um, is people are perceiving it to not be as dangerous. And so that's also part of their resistance to it. They're saying, well, you know, I know people who've had smallpox 
they didn't get sick, um, nobody died, it's not a big deal. Now, this particular um, moment in 1902 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, Henny Jacobson, right, he's a recent Swedish immigrant, and the vaccinators have come to his door and said that he needed to be vaccinated, his son needed to be vaccinated. They said, you know, you have, you're supposed to have a card that shows that you've been vaccinated within a certain period of time. And Jacobson says, I'm not going to get vaccinated, right? I got a vaccine once when I was a kid. It made me very sick. It made my son sick. You know, I'm not going to get vaccinated. And, and he was fined $5 for that. And what's interesting is Jacobson, um, he took this to court and he, he said, you know, I'm not going to pay this fine. He pleads not guilty. He says, the government doesn't have a right. To, to tell me that I have to be vaccinated or to find me for not being vaccinated. And this case goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And so the court is trying to decide, right, is does the state have the right um, to require someone to be vaccinated? And the Supreme Court says yes. And you'll see the, the argument here is that under the pressure of great dangers to the safety of the general pub public, you can restrict individual liberty. And so on one hand, they say, yes, the government has a right, right, to, for the safety of the public to, to restrict your liberty. But also they say that vaccination is reasonable, that it is reasonable to require vaccination because the, here is the government recognizing vaccination, right, as least an effective, if not the best known way in which to meet and suppress the evils of a smallpox epidemic that imperils the entire population. And in the aftermath here, you see the New York Times, that it seems like in at the end of this case, right, that you've got you've ended a conversation about one, the benefit of vaccination. They said, yes, vaccination is good. It is a moral good. It is a public health good. Um, and then also that the government has the right to require it. It comes up again before the Supreme Court in 1922. And this is a case in San Antonio about the school district requiring vaccination because uh, smallpox still, requiring vaccination, not in an outbreak, right? In 22, there isn't a massive outbreak of smallpox. This is, the, this is just a state requirement that students that go to schools have to have, have the vaccine. Um, and again, the Supreme Court decides on the, on the side of the state and saying, yes, that it is, it is legal to require vaccination for going to school. So that this first part of the story was all about smallpox because that was the only vaccine at first. Um, later, you know, Pasteur creates the rabies vaccine, but that is only used when someone has actually has rabies. And the same thing with the diphtheria um, toxin that was only used when someone had it. So smallpox was the only sort of preventative vaccine available in the, you know, by the time you get to around the early 1900s. And this second shift and sort of we can see the modern vaccination um, movement is really with polio. And <clears throat> that story begins in 54 um, with the, the polio pioneers, which is this, you know, it's the largest field trial in medical history there in 1954. And you can see the map where all the trials are. And they're all school children that were used, right? It was over, some say, I've read 1.4, I've read up to 1.6. So one and a half million um, school children in the United States who test the polio vaccine, this new vaccine. And it is proven successful, right? Um, and you can see here a reason why people were so eager to um, sign their kids up for the, for the, um, the vaccine trials is because polio had become like, the largest sort of medical fear for, for American uh, families. So they're, they're quite happy to do it. And then the response, though, what's interesting with this is that it involves the federal government. So this act of 1955 with Eisenhower, the federal government is now going to provide $30 million for states to purchase vaccine. And that's new. That had, that had not been done before. So it was the federal government becoming involved in vaccination. And the vaccine is enormously successful, right? I mean, you can see the cases. It's just, it's, it's an overwhelming success with the vaccine. There is one case <coughs> where there is a batch, um, a batch that was prepared incorrectly. 
And that was important too, because even at that moment, there were those fears from before about, well, are you spreading, you know, are you spreading other disease? Are you spreading live polio with this vaccine? But the federal government gets involved in that as well and saying, well, what we're going to do now is more closely monitor the production of vaccines. And <laughs> Eisenhower was kind of reluctant about this, but Kennedy is not. And, and what happens in this modern vaccine era is there's a clear party difference between Republicans and Democratic um, presidencies about support for vaccination. And, and Kennedy um, himself pushes for this, what becomes this vaccine um, Vaccination Assistance Act of 1962. And you can read here this public law, right? To help states and communities to carry out intensive vaccination programs designed to protect their populations, particularly preschool children, polio, polio, diphtheria, whooping cough, and tetanus. Because at this point, then the two most important vaccines, um, you have the polio vaccine and you have the DPT shot. And this act, as it's originally created, is just money to help with short-term vaccination campaigns. And that's how it's structured, that here's a you know an influx of money to help states all over the country vaccinate preschool children. And you can see here, um, it, it, it takes um, the form of Welby, which some of you might remember, the little, the bee who he's really um, pushing for polio, but they they often will try to do them at the same time. They'd say, well, we can vaccinate people against polio. And we can also then at the same time vaccinate children um, with, with the DPT shot. And it's in the midst of these campaigns that the CDC becomes the the organizing body of recommendations of vaccination in the United States. And again, this is a shift of like power to the federal government. The CDC had been created in the 1950s, um, originally created to coordinate malaria control efforts and then becomes the CDC, in the midst of that becomes the CDC that we know today um, that also does, does investigations of, of diseases and sort of a place where the reporting, you know, the reporting of the nation on mortality and morbidity. Um, and so this, where they create this advisory committee, and before you had the American uh, Association P Academy of Pediatrics that would make recommendations for vaccines, but now the CDC after 64 considers that its job, that it is the, the entity in the United States who will make recommendations on vaccines. In, in the midst of this campaign of the 1960s on the federal government's part, you also have in large part because of the work of Maurice Hillman, um, who a scientist who, who works at Merck at this period. Um, and I, he creates, I believe, 20 total vaccines, like nine of the vaccines that we give today, Hillman created himself. Um, and they Merck creates these vaccines against measles, against mumps, against rubella. And then he creates the MMR vaccine to, to bring them all together in 71. So you have also this interesting um, moment in the 1960s where for many of these, these were diseases that people sort of understood as just childhood diseases, that these were just things you got. And, and true, I think every human being before 1963 got measles. I mean, it is probably the most infectious um, entity on earth. And, and they really do, like everyone would get measles. That was just part, so again, it was part of growing up. But in the campaigns, the question is, okay, but some people have complications and thousands of people die of these diseases. Um, and so you can see how they're trying to convince people to get these vaccines, right? So pointing out, this is later in the 70s, pointing out um, some of the, the severe effects. And rubella was particularly interesting because you can see the way it was framed. It wasn't about protecting children from, from rubella. It was about protecting unborn children because of course, pregnant women who got the disease um, had it created severe um, complications for their for their pregnancies. So it had to have, they had to have like a specific campaign to convince people that yes, this isn't really about your child, but it's about other people's child or children to convince people to get that vaccine. And with mumps, they it's interesting with mumps, they also have to really convince people that it's serious to say, you know, um, yes, most people don't have complications with mumps, but some people do. <coughs> and 
there, um, you, what you see, t- again, this democratic initiative, when Carter comes into office, he accepts this idea that it is in fact the federal government's job to, to continue vaccination and to really support mass vaccination. Um, under Johnson, they had extended the vaccine, you know, the vaccine act assistance act. They had, they had continued it. Um, and, and Carter wants to move beyond it and, and moving beyond it in 1977 was to create a permanent system to say, this isn't, you know, temporary money given to states to help states do a, you know, a temporary campaign. This is money to create, you know, a permanent system that, that vaccinates the, you know, three to 4 million kids born every year in the United States, that we've got to set a system in place that they're all vaccinated. And the goal there is 90% vaccination rate by 1970. And in the midst of this initiative, right, state governments take that as a sign that now is a good time to expand their school vaccination requirements. So on one hand, you have more vaccines have been created and then in the 60s and then in the 70s, those vaccines then become requirements for going to school. And notably with during an outbreak of measles in 1977 in Los Angeles, um, the Los Angeles school district refuses, like, I think it's 20,000 children are told they cannot, they can't enter their school building um, because they don't, they don't have the vaccines. So it was the first moment of, uh, you know, of, of a city in that case, of a state, of a city saying, you know, you can't come in here. You can't come to school if you don't have that vaccine. And that set a trend. Right? And that was seen as, okay, we really can act more seriously about that. Now, it's because of this. Right. And they really do. Um, they get to uh, a high rate of childhood vaccines. There's a backlash. And again, it's part of this. You can see this pattern of when things are more compulsory, right? When there are more requirements, there is a backlash against it. Now, the specific backlash that happens in the early 1980s is about the DPT shot and that there are reactions to the DPT shot with kids. There is a small number of children who would have um, sort of localized reactions to it and even smaller number of children who had serious complications in response to the DPT vaccine. And I think it was on CBS was the vaccine, it was CBS or NBC who did this report on this in 1982. And then this book comes out in 1985 about it, um, about parents, um, you know, warning against, warning specifically in this case against the DPT shot. And this, It appears that we're having a few technical difficulties with Dr. McVitie, but bear with us and we will be right back online once we get in touch with her. Thanks.
Hello there. Well, it would not be 2020 or 2021 without some technological issues. We do apologize. Unfortunately, we have been unable to resolve the technical issues and get Dr. McVitie back on the screen with us. We will be working to reschedule that. The irony is not lost on us that a global pandemic on a virtual presentation of vaccinations uh, ultimately was uh, ended due to technical difficulties. With that being said, we do want to set, uh, send a special thanks to Dr. McVitie for getting us at least through the Carter administration and hopefully we'll be able to continue this into the future. Uh, we encourage you, our next session uh, that will be coming up at 2 p.m. here just in several minutes is From Big Brother to Big Data, Why Miami is at the Forefront of the Data Science Field. That will be presented by Sandy Steiger, Director of Miami Center for Analytics and Data Science. Again, that starts at 2 p.m. There are unique URLs for each session, so please refer to your registration email for the link to that presentation or by clicking events by type on this website's top toolbar. And again, selecting Winter College 2021 from the drop down menu. On behalf of the Miami University Alumni Association, thanks for joining us for at least part of this webinar. Stay healthy, stay safe, love and honor.